Thank you for joining us. This is Paul Wilson. And Chris Emke. And you're listening, or maybe not watching, watching. Diesel yeah. Performance Podcast. Uh, Chris, we have kind of talked about this for a long time, and I think I'm, re- I-, I know I am really excited to say uh, we are finally going to produce a regular basis yeah. a video format of Diesel Performance Podcast. There's been a lot of demand for this, Paul. You know, we've talked about it. We, you know, we, we've had a lot of uh, behind the scenes in a, you know, meetings and stuff like that about, yeah. you know, what does the future of our content look like? You know, what does our listeners and our fan base demand? What are they looking for? Um, and this does a couple different things for us. I think and it's going to open up, you know, that door to new opportunities. Absolutely. And hey, for the guys who are out there listening and you just want to keep listening, nothing will change. Nope. Uh, all of the podcasts will still come out in its own uh, total audio format just the way it always has and then if you want to watch or if you're more of a youtuber uh now you'll have the chance to go on to the youtube and check out diesel performance podcast and uh make sure to like and subscribe of course when you find the channel yeah i mean it's going to give us an opportunity you know balance balance with interviews yeah um industry experts getting them on board maybe even having them as a visual on this maybe not in our studio but having that be kind of like a segue or cutaway right sure um and sharing a lot of good information and what i like the most of is our ride-alongs and stuff like that and having that in a video i love um, that where you know you get to you get to see our expressions. You get to <laughs> see what we're experiencing and what we're going through, which is awesome. That's so. right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So absolutely, I'm I'm stoked for it. I think this is going to be a, a really cool addition uh, to Diesel Performance Podcast. I know all of our sponsors are excited to participate yeah. as well. Uh, so make sure you check those guys out. Of course, that's Duramax Tuner, Calibrated Power, where Chris and I uh, work, yeah. and then uh, as well as Exergy Performance. Worley Custom Fabrication and Extreme XCP. Diesel Performance uh, have all been on board to support our show and support the content, so we're, we're really grateful for that. Uh, going from here, the other big news going on right now, Chris, Black Friday's coming. I'm tired of talking about it already. <laughs> so, you know, it's uh, as, a, as a buyer in any industry, right, the holidays are near, and that's usually where you get the biggest amount of savings or opportunity, right, yep. for, for a good service product um so we know already what we kind of have in the in the in the pipeline right in our hopper of offerings yeah man we're, we're so, gonna hit the we're gonna hit all a bunch of the tuning products we're gonna hit a bunch of the turbo products yep. uh there's gonna be some specials out there for six speed conversion like kits yep. and some others we're keeping it quiet right now uh so the final details are coming out we're going to be announcing it next week I think just about every year we try to announce Black Friday deals and specials and sales from Duramax Tuner on the podcast. That's usually the yeah, first place. That's usually that we the break first news. place we have that leverage, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, and just like years prior, you know, it's going to be a big sale. It's a big, wide product offering. One of the things I love about, you know, working where we work is as years progress, we get into a, a wider product offering, you know, for, for different years and RPOs. Right. And that's not always necessarily the new stuff. No. We have a couple turbos in the hopper for some of the older Cummins and stuff like that, <laughs> that, you know, we didn't think that we'd be going backwards on, but the, the demand's there. So, right. you know, chances are, guys, if you're a listener, whether you have an older Cummins, a newer Cummins, you know, any year of the Duramaxes, Power Stroke from 20, 2013 on up, you know, we might be able to have something for you. So, you know, keep on checking out our, you know, calibrated power Duramax tuner announcements, stuff like that, because we'll have more to come on that. Absolutely. Guys, uh, today's episode we are doing in one of our new formats about knowledge sharing, where Chris and I have taken the time, uh, sat down and kind of talked about, hey, here's a topic that we talk to a lot of people about uh, just in the world. And this is the thing we think a lot of you have questions about. Uh, So we titled it today, How to Destroy Your DPF. I think realistically, we're probably diving in more to like, what are those causes? Like, yeah. what? How does a DPF work? What is a DPF? Why do they fail? Why do they have such a bad name and such a bad reputation? Yeah, no, I think you know it's it's kind of like that uh, that black art in a sense, right? Like, they've been on trucks for years, but people want to adopt old technology, old service intervals, old service protocols. Uh, they don't really understand how some of that stuff works. Yeah, and it's expensive to invest your time and money into understanding how that works. Absolutely. Um, so calibrated power. You know where we work, what we do for a day to day. That's exactly what our profession is, right? That's like it. it, it's clean emissions on power. So yes, we know those recipes in making power, but we also understand the pitfalls and the shortcomings of why emissions fail. 
So we want to be able to broadcast that, right? We want to be vocal. We want to be transparent with all of our listeners. Like, hey, yeah, is the emissions another component that moves on a vehicle and has a potential to fail? Yes. Is it making it more complex for the platform as a whole? Yes. However, there is also different practices and maintenance and things that you could look at in the event you are running into a problem that I think is overseen by pretty much every dealer in in the U.S. and and a lot of those higher-end skilled diesel shops right now. Sure. Well, also take into consideration we're coming up on 2022 model year trucks are out yeah 07 07 and Guy, a half, guys are putting in 23 orders paul right that's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. just real it, right, right? So. um so but 07 07 and a half is when dpfs hit trucks right. on the mass market we're talking about 15 years there, there's 15 years of background with these so well now let, let, let's back into that just a tad more right 07 and a half dpfs were introduced okay 0304 were were when egrs were starting to become introduced they OEM didn't have EGRs really figured out. Then they have to throw a DPF into the equation. Yep. And unfortunately, it's federal man- mandates that cause this. So you have an EGR, not the best. A DPF, they didn't really have figured out. So even though the technology is old, they really didn't start figuring out the technology until the middle 20 teens, in my opinion. Yeah, we've after, seen that with these After vehicles. the SCR and, and DEF was Correct. introduced and everything else. Once they got to that final tier four, they, they pushed, yeah, you're, you're right. The industry pushed OEMs into final tier four yep. very quickly. Now that final tier four is out and the OEM has had to eat all of this warranty right. labor and warranty parts and all of this extra cost and this bad reputation that's we're not finally, good for them. We're finally at a position. Finally, we're at the other end yep. of it where, where we're starting to see things get better. Now, for the very basics, I did want to break down some of the simple things that, hey, if you're new to diesel, you've been driving your LB7 forever. You don't exactly know the DPF and everything that well beyond some of the bad stuff yep. you hear. Uh, it is a diesel particulate filter. Really? That's <laughs> <laughs> a, a diesel particulate filter. It, it's the muffler looking thing on in the exhaust. Now, there's I, I a think couple. That's the simplest way. There's a couple muffler looking things, there you is, know, yep. in the system. So you're going to have a, a catalyst, you know, a catalytic converter. Yep. You're going to have your no, DPF. Notice a DOC in these. Yeah, yep. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. DOC and DPF generally going to be really close to each other. And we're, and we're going to talk about why that is as we kind of break some of this stuff down. Right. Um, the the simplest way to form it is is that the function is just to catch extra smoke. Yep. Uh, smoke is diesel particulate matter. So if you're ever like looking up this stuff, you'll see it listed as either PM or DPM in capital letters. Yep. Particulate matter, diesel particulate matter, depends on who's phrasing it. Um, once it fills this filter up with particulate matter or smoke, uh, then it's actually going to burn it all off. And that process is called regen. regen. So, Chris, there's a couple different ways that regen can be initiated or a couple different types of regen your truck might go through. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there, there's, there is three forms and there's really two good forms. One not so good <laughs> one form you really hope is you the best to way do. to put that. Yeah. Now, depending on the, the truck, uh, for the first two forms, you have active regen and passive regen, which we'll get into. Some trucks aren't set up for passive regen until you get into some of the newer platforms. Yeah. Um, so what active regen is, is the DPF uh, basically collects soot, you know, uh, diesel particulate matter. And once it gets to its threshold, uh, the engine is going to heat up, um, dosing fuel, um, and that's going to make its way downstream into the exhaust to burn off the particulate matter and get that particulate matter back down to a zero or a positive load, right? That's uh, right. To go yep. back through yep. the reoccurring uh, process. Um, what's unique on some of the platforms Platforms, uh, I believe the, the the Cummins platform was the first to do this. They offer what's called a passive regen. Now, what this means is, is let's say you're driving on the open road, the truck itself is maintaining a temperature, it's maintaining a certain vehicle speed RPM. It can actually heat the catalyst up itself naturally to burn off soot matter. So the truck is never actually regening, but it's able to clean up the filter or maintain filter load as operating the truck. You know, as you're driving it. Absolutely correct. Um, Now, the last one is something that I don't personally like, um, and that's (laughs) a manual regen. And basically, this is going to be warranted if... The truck isn't actively regening on its own. You have a mechanical issue somewhere in the system, and you need to uh, command the truck to burn off the particulate matter. 
The best way to describe this, Paul, is like nail biting. Okay, it is <laughs> it is aggressive. The truck is sitting in a in a uh, red line RPM style situation, letting soot you know letting the system get hot to burn off soot. It sounds like a, a connecting rod's about to go through the block. It yeah. is ridiculous to hear. Um, and you got to think about it, guys. It's not good that you're not getting any airflow through the radiator. You're not getting any air to help cool things off. Um, yeah. So it's it's really your end all be all. And I get guys that call and they're like, well, what's a tool I can use so I can just manually do a regen once a week? No, no absolutely no, no, not. No. That is not <laughs> what that's intended for. Well, think about some of the temperatures that it takes to do this. So in the vehicles that do offer a passive regen, you're usually looking at a minimum of the exhaust gas temperatures getting up to 660 degrees right. plus. Um so, so in that 660 degrees at the back end of your exhaust. So, if you just think about like we watch EGTs on the manifold, yeah. guys are used to seeing seven, eight hundred degrees driving down the road right. at 55 on the highway. Well, now we need the tailpipe exhaust to be near that 660 yeah. degrees. That's a lot of temperature. So, your trucks need heat, and that's one of the big things and on that's EPA the same temperature when the truck's sitting there. That's right. Know. That's right. Yeah. Uh, now, if we look at like an active regen, so like you said, that's when we're actually dosing fuel. There's a couple different ways to do that. I think the LML is the only one with a ninth injector. I think Correct. everything else actually just sprays fuel during the exhaust stroke Correct. Uh, and pushes fuel down. Now, that fuel mixes with what's called the DOC, yep. the diesel oxidation catalyst, uh, and that actually creates a chemical reaction. And that's what creates the super amount of heat. So it's not like your fuel is combusting in your exhaust. Right. It's actually interacting with the, the metals and the materials inside of the DOC. Right. That's creating a, a, the catalyst. Uh, so that's creating the super amount of heat that heats up your, your DPF. Um, so an active regen, we're seeing <laughs> the exhaust temperature in the DPF over a thousand degrees yeah. that that's really what they're looking for pretty much at a, at a standard or a minimum to maintain, uh, to maintain it uh, and then a manual regen you're still you're still getting to a thousand degrees because they're assuming that the truck wasn't able to burn it off right. at the, the standard level for the for the active regen so it, it is like you said, it feels detrimental. Right. Now, let, let's dive into that just a tad more. I know we're going to get into that later in the show about, you know, DPF health and, you know, just uh, what warrants soot accumulation more so in a mechanically sound truck versus not. Yeah. But what's going to warrant a manual regen is a truck that has a mechanical um, uh, a mechanical downfall to the point where it's not either A, able to regen correctly, or B, it's accumulating soot much faster than what the, the, the factory had designed or warranted the system to collect. Yeah. There's usually a mechanical downfall or a mechanical roadblock in the truck that's interfering with the actual process. That's right. That's right. So it's one of those things where, you know, if you have to be that guy to do a manual regen on the truck, you are already past, you know, the, the bill of health of the truck to say, hey, this is turnkey. I'm going to get it back on the road. Yeah. This is going to be one of those things you're going to want to diagnose and figure out what's going on. It's, I'd look at it like fix a flat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it it could it could get you home. There's some it's of the Fords, get you home. Some of the Fords, you, you can drive or select a, yeah. a manual regen. Um, it, it, like I said, it's like fix a flat. You know, my I, my wife got a, a Kia, and yeah. in the back next to the spare tire, there is like essentially their own Kia, like fix a flat, yeah, I mean, makes it pump. You and know I'm what? Like, I, and that's not a I bad thing, right? It'll I'm get not. You home. I'm not going to use a fix yeah. a flat and drive from Illinois to California tomorrow. Right. 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 <laughs> exactly. And that that's the piece here. You know, if you're driving yeah. down the road and you're having issues with the truck, and you have the ability to do a manual regen, and you're a hundred miles from home, and you just want to limp at home, you know, I can understand to a certain degree <laughs> what you're trying to do there instead of getting tied up at a dealer. Sure. Um, but in a perfect world, like that's not what I would be practicing in my day-to-day -day regimen as a diesel truck owner is you concerned. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. They're too expensive. Um, okay. So so we get a lot of questions. Does the DPF actually work? Does it do anything? Um, I'm not going to weigh in on like hard opinions on this. Uh, I'll give you a couple facts. Uh, number one, according to the EPA and CARB, DPFs are effective at reducing 85 to 90 percent of particulate matter at a bare minimum, and that was published in like 2007. So since then, I believe they're up to 95, and a lot of places will quote like uh, DPF, like retrofit companies and things like that, where you have to put them on like some of the big rigs. Uh, the retrofits 95 to 100 percent effective at, at, at oh. eliminating diesel particulate matter. Um, so they, they work. They work for the purpose of filtering out particulate matter, period. Now, there are 
problems with them. Um, like even the EPA in 2010, I, I caught a, a published doc that had a, a really good quote in there, Chris. It said, engine problems with fuel control or oil consumption may quickly deteriorate the performance of a DPF. I mean, it, but we've seen this, that makes right? Sense. Like that, that makes goes sense. back to the bill of health. And one of the things that I always talk to guys about, you know, when there's no secret, we get calls over at Calibrated Power about, hey, I want to delete my truck yeah. or I want to do this or that. And they're running into issues. But um, l- let, let's go out a limb here and let's assume that your turbocharger's exhaust seal uh, that, that seals the back end of the turbo is leaking and you have oil uh, weeping through and getting into that exhaust. Yeah. That oil goes downstream and it actually will like caramelize on the filter and on the yeah. cat. That over time, that buildup, that's going <laughs> to dramatically affect. Like think of think of I, I I was cleaning my stove this weekend, right? Yeah. Think about when I'm I'm cooking in my stove and I have like uh, cheese or butter or whatever melt and drip off and get to the bottom. That cakes up and builds up and it continuously burns and burns and burns. It never deteriorates and goes away. Right. It builds up and it cakes up. Well, it's funny you bring that up. So so that's one of the things about DPF. So when they talk about the life of a DPF, uh, we came across some really hilarious videos from guys uh, in Australia, auto expert. Um yeah, I, I don't think we have to, to go into the clip. We'll give you guys a reference to get over to the video so you can see it. It, it was quite hilarious. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things that they bring up is essentially every time you you go through regen, it's burning all of that soot, well, soot becomes ash. And that right. ash stays in the filter. It right. doesn't like blow out of the filter for the most part. So, so the ash is building up, building up, building up, and that eventually is going to eat up what's inside of your right. DPF. Of course. It, it is a... A replacement part, like yep. you mentioned earlier, like it is like any other moving, working part that sees heat and cold and and air and exhaust run through it. Is that eventually there is a potential for it to fail? Likely, and we'll, and we'll get into some of these failures as we go things, forward. Is, one of, one is of the ash big things I would see time. with that, Paul, is the biggest miss in the OEM is it's not a serviceable part. Yeah, right. To, yeah. to that point, but for and and I. I believe that is under the direction of EPA standards because once it becomes serviceable, it also becomes replaceable right. for delete kits. So, it also becomes so making two V-band adjustable. clamps on either side of right. your TPF all of a sudden right. makes it like really basic to just delete it, right? But so, that also means that there's a lifespan. You know, there's yeah, a life expectancy, just like an engine, just like a turbo. You know? A lot of the quotes that I found were that they expect EPFs to run about 150,000 miles. Yeah. So that's. That's I think on the on the good side. Honestly, if you're using your truck like a truck, and we'll talk about this more, if you're using your truck like a truck and it's towing a lot and it's seeing a lot of highway time, that's pretty realistic. That's what we see, yep. right? One hundred fifty thousand miles. That, that's a good. That's yeah, a good I run. Mean, think about this, right? Think of I amount of miles used, and then you have to think about the age of the truck. Right? Yeah. Now we've dealt with hot shotters that have gone. 300, 400,000 miles Easy. and still have the factory DPF. Sure. But they've racked those hundreds of thousands of miles on their trucks within five or six years. Oh, yeah. Right? Now you get a truck, right? We'll, we'll talk about the era that we're in. We're in November of 2021. Think of the guy that bought that LML Duramax in the era of November 2011. Yeah. And that truck only has 150,000 miles. <laughs> that that, that 150,000 miles for that age truck is going to see more abuse than the guy that racked up the miles in four or five years. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, you have to think about that stuff, too. Age plays a role. It, it absolutely plays a role. And and as a general rule of thumb as well, the newer the vehicle, the more reliable the emissions equipment. Yep. Um, is that perfect? Does that mean if you go and buy a 2021 today that you're never going to have a DPF issue? And then issue? they're going to call you saying, no. you said this. No, Chris said that, and I'll give you his <laughs> extension. Um, no, <laughs> no, but, but <laughs> what, what you will see is, is, is you'll see the systems have gotten smarter, yep. the the components have gotten better, the craftsmanship has gotten better, the reliability is improving. Uh, there's still things that can go wrong. And well, I think one of the biggest things that we see go wrong, Chris, is it, it really starts with something that's that's common just in all diesel trucks, and that's a boost leak. Well, let's backtrack a little bit there. You mentioned prior that the systems have gotten smarter, Yeah. right? In my opinion, the dealers in the shops haven't. Right, yeah. and that's where these things kind of come about. Um, as a as a practice, right, when we bring trucks into our shop, whether it's tuning, it's it's mechanical work, um, you know, just a basic diagnosis, we practice a boost leak down test. Right, we want to ensure that the air charge system is sealed. That's right. We've seen too many times emissions issues, smoky trucks, EGT, you know, high EGT, you know, 
situations are caused directly from a lack of airflow situation from a boost leak. All right. Yeah, yeah. And then and that's where we're that's where I wonder how well people understand the correlation between boost leaks and DPF failures. Because yep. as we're talking today about what destroys the DPF, a boost leak I think jumps right to the top of our of our list of the, things that you, you see it go wrong and you see it go wrong quick. And one of the reasons is because you're you're dramatically impacting the air fuel ratio. So I think a lot of times in the past we've talked about unmetered fuel and in, in other applications. Right. This is this becomes unmetered air um, and you're losing boost pressure. Can you kind of walk people through that that rundown of why does losing why does a boost leak destroy a DPF? Yeah. So you have to think the the truck, the factory ECM has a targeted air fuel ratio, and that works with lambda limiters. Okay, right. so when the truck has its air and entering the induction system, right, the, your air filter, and it, it runs past a mass airflow sensor, MAF sensor. Um, depending on how much air volume is going past that sensor, that's what's going to dictate how much fuel is being injected into the motor. Okay? That's right. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's based on boost because it's not speed density. It's not fueling by boost pressure. It's it's fueling by mass airflow pressure. Um, so you'll get uh, in a situation like this X amount of fuel that's being uh, injected to accommodate X amount of air. Well, when you have that air boost escaping to the atmosphere and not working in its closed loop system, you're going to get a truck that's going to essentially burn rich. That's right. Okay. That's right. Now, one of the things that I see a lot with guys is they'll call and they'll be like, oh, dang emission system. Um, I had an NOx sensor uh, bank one, and then I had NOx sensor two, and then I, I had to replace the sensor one again. And they're, they're constantly flip flopping these sensors. Yeah. That is 101 boost leak. <laughs> like, that is 101 boost leak. I don't care if the performance is under, over, and you're, sen- you're just popping sensors back and forth. Chances are, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Yeah. Right. So that's, you know, one of the many reasons why I would warrant doing that. Sure. Right. Sure. And and boost leaks, the problem with running rich on a diesel with a DPF is that we talked before about regen. Yeah. And what are the regen intervals and how often should you be using fuel to heat the DPF to right. burn that soot off? So if we're getting a too rich of a mixture because we've lost that boost and we're sending too much fuel for the air that's actually in the combustion yeah. cylinder, then that's going to really rapidly shorten the amount of time between your intervals so your fuel it's, mileage is going to go down. Well, right. The truck is it's basically <clears throat> it's a, a, accumulating soot. Yeah. Quicker than than normal. Therefore, it has to dose that fuel. So now the truck isn't efficiently making the power that it needs to. Sure. Now the truck is dosing fuel more uh, more periodically well, right, the, to and, burn off and, that. And soot. this this it works all the way around the horn, yeah. right? Because because you're losing fuel mileage because you have a boost leak. Right. So then you're losing fuel mileage because you're into regen more often. Right. Of course. So it's like you're kind of getting double, double hit edged on sword, that man. one, right? <laughs> double so edged like, sword. Like it hurts both yeah. ways. Um. And then and then you're constantly you're heating something more often than it was meant to be heated. So again, we talked about ash accumulation in your DPF. So the number of regens your yep. DPF goes through directly impacts That's how gonna, long its life span, is going to span. Right? So if you've had a bunch of these boost leak problems early on in the truck, which they develop for all sorts of reasons. You had mentioned like up pipes. How many times have we seen up pipes on like oh. an LML leaking? And now you're like, nobody knew. We didn't right. like... Well, the up pipes, but that's on the exhaust side. That's yeah. going to be different. So, yeah. you know, realistically from, from an air charge setup, right? Oh, right, from, right, the right, boost, right. from the boost setup, you'll run into something small like, you know, a, a boot, right? Or you'll run into something a little bit more aggressive that isn't something you're going to see from the naked eye. Um, and that's maybe the intercooler end, you oh, know, man. popped out or blew out, right? We've seen that. How many times? Um, what I don't want anyone f- listening to this episode to take away from this is, well, my truck makes 28 pounds of boost. There's no boost. Leak. That doesn't mean anything, <laughs> right? Um, it's an old one. That's now old let's one, switch yeah. gears. Let's talk about the exhaust side. Right. You could have an exhaust leak. You could have an up pipe bellow blown out. I've seen uh, where the EGR riser attaches to the cooler. That uh, that's yeah. uh, gasket blows that's out. Gasket's gone. Um, yeah. I've been in trucks where you hear this, and it's like a manifold leak right right off of the head. Understanding now, an exhaust leak on a diesel is really easy to point out because you usually see the black soot buildup around right. that area. But if that exhaust energy isn't being used to drive that turbine wheel, that's also going to aid a 
low boost outcome exactly. and that's going to also aid a dirtier burn so you could get all, all of these same symptoms yeah. if you have leaking air on either side right, right. is really is really what, what it comes down to um so charged air system turbo to the manifold uh exhaust system everywhere else yeah. pretty much i think is the easy way to put it uh boost testing so we've been through boost testers i think we've done like a whole episode on the podcast about boost testing uh we talk about boost testing all the time we obviously we have this really cool stealth boost tester over here at duramax tuner you guys can check that out um there's adapters for cummins and pretty much every any, duramax yeah. and all sorts of other cool stuff uh so what we really like to see now after you know 10 or 15 years of boost testing diesels is we'd like to see you we want want you to test test the turbo too because especially like Cummins, pretty notorious for leaking at the compressor seen, cover straight out of the OEM. We've seen it on a lot of different RPOs, and I think one of the biggest. Cummins. Well, you see it on all of them, right? But you know, the biggest thing is is I'll talk to guys and you're like, oh, I've had guys say, well, I've pressurized the intercooler. Okay, well. Uh, why would you close off one end of the intercooler, pressurize the other <laughs> side like that? That's great, but that's not the system, there, there right? There are a lot of concerns. There a lot are. of people have concerns you know, about, about how to boost test. Well, let, let, let's, yeah. let's, let's, let's dummy this down, right? You have a Duramax, okay? Or you have a Power Stroke, because I, I want to go and attack the V8 market here real quick. Sure. You have the um, inlet of the turbocharger. <laughs> Right, so yeah. you have uh, potential areas of leakage: the compressor housing to the center section of the turbo. One, then you have the discharge boot from the turbocharger to the intercooler pipe spot there. Yeah. Then you have intercooler pipe to the intercooler. Then you have intercooler to intercooler pipe for how it gets routed back in, into the motor. Sure, cold side. Then, uh, yeah, the cold side at that point. Then you have the cold side pipe going to you know like the Y bridge. Right. Then you have the Y bridge meeting up to the runners, and then you have the runners going to the head. Yeah. I just named seven potential <laughs> components for where a leakage can occur, that, and we've seen leakage it, in all of those. It's probably fourteen because it could be the pipe or the boot on any one. It of could. Those I options. mean, you just multiply that, That's right? Exactly. No, just, exactly it's, it. It's now, brutal. In the Cummins, you know, you're also going to have the the turbo to the housing, right? Yep. You're going to have your hot side or cold side intercooler pipe at the assemblies of going to the intercooler sure. and discharging off of, and then on the Cummins, you got this unique, um, you know, the intake runner is part of the head. Yeah. So it's, if you have a leak there like you've, you've really fucked stuff up <laughs> um but you have the intake runner the sill and then you have the intake horn yeah um so i mean th right there there's another six seven it's spots and now you talk about a truck that's 10 12 years old it's got 150,000 miles it's got a fresh you know, turbo it's got a fresh turbo <laughs> um you know you've done a couple oil changes and you've bumped some you know pipes along the way like it it's happens. possible man yeah it's possible so it's not only possible is it's Based on our experience, it's probable. If it, you have some of these other reality. symptoms, yeah. it, it's probable. It's a great place to start. And it's it's also like if you want if you need to DIY this, please, dear God, use regulated air to boost test your truck. Yeah. Um but like and once goes, you have a regulated air source, like I've seen guys put together a P you know, PVC kit that like it works. It, it didn't cost much and it, it works. Like if, if that's what you have to do, that's better than nothing. I would recommend like a nice premium kit like yeah. the stealth boost tester, but do you But there's also there's this isn't uh like a a, a this isn't just emissions on trucks. Yeah. Right, is what I'm trying to get across. We we see this a lot with the emissions off trucks, you know, the older trucks. The, the, the problem with that is is those trucks didn't have the the moving components to be taken out in the mix you know they just think like oh my truck's tuned it you know it's always blown a little smoke it's just it's gotten worse over the years sure therefore I'm gonna identify that with well the truck's tired well I think that brings up a good point Chris about like the DPF failure is rarely the cause and often a symptom of a problem. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I think you'll see as we start to drill through these. Uh, one of the one of the next things that I thought was like absolutely super common, super easy way to kill your DPF is just only do start and stop traffic and extremely long idle times. Uh, pipeline workers, you're notorious for this. We love you guys, but get out on the highway. Uh, city dwellers who you know are running back and forth to work and stop and go traffic, and then park it in a high or park it in a parking lot and drive it back home. You guys have this problem too. Uh, I used to live super close to work, and I'll be honest, like any of the emissions equipped trucks that I ever drove back and forth for work you never was gave like it an opportunity to do. Anything. I, I'd have to get out and drive it 
It, you, I couldn't just yeah. do that because I was only driving 20 miles a week. And, and that this is a great way to kill a DPF and without it necessarily being your fault. You know, like you bought the truck, you expected it. Not only could it tow, you know, a shit brick house, you thought it would also be able to drive back and forth in the city. And that, that's a reasonable expectation. And that's where I think a little education goes a long way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, things like CTS three monitors or whatever CTS monitor can tell you. Uh, when regen is happening or give you any better monitoring equipment of your DPF activity, uh, those are always really good ideas. But but you got to remember, active regen, like we were talking about, the most common, the most effective, the preferred method of regen, assuming your truck doesn't passive regen all the time. Um, it's going to be that active state. Only works if you're going yeah. generally over 40 miles an hour. I think some of the trucks, if I was trying to look it up, I think some of the Fords will do it at 35. But generally, 35, Mostly 40, 40 miles an hour, it will yep. not, it, will, it won't regen if you don't break that. And regen, I don't know, like an LML is probably the last truck I had to drive with a regen, Chris. And it was went from full to like, you know, those, they're like 40, whatever, 50 grams. And then 40, it'll run down to 43, 44. 43, grams, 44, yeah. it'll run up to. And then it'll run down to like 13, is what I saw. Um, took 30 minutes yeah. like it like it took 30 minutes of being over 40 miles an hour it's not like oh i did five minutes and then next week it's i went clean. out and did another yep. five minutes yep. it's like no i had to go out and go 30 minutes non-stop of over 40 miles an hour so really that highway driving and that's why we were talking earlier about hot shotters and guys who use their truck and drive mm -hmm. their trucks in the highway they generally have a better experience with a dps well they use their truck in that element consistently yeah right? exactly is they're they're driving at those highway speeds they're getting it to up and working um and and this is this is what exhaust gas temperature is all about. So one, you're seeing more and more a part of the EPA regulations are about how quickly a truck needs to come up to temperature, mm -hmm. and that's because trucks emit higher amounts of pollutants at cold temperatures. Yep. That's just the way the science works on chemistry. Okay, um, so the those gas those exhaust gas temperatures get raised. We talked about earlier a DOC, so the diesel oxidation catalyst. Um, it's pretty much only used for for the regen process that, right. that's literally all it is um like like we said the lml has a ninth injector everything else sends fuel through the exhaust stroke for this uh once it has to hit that light off temperature for it to start to be effective mm -hmm. right and if you have any any experience with like an old like cat catalytic converter or anything yeah. like that same idea it has to hit that light off temperature before they start working so these are generally around that 590 degrees fahrenheit give or take um it does uh create a chemical reaction which is something i didn't really know a ton about um Yo, you're not a chemist i'm not, not i'm not a chemist thank god uh just to state that clearly uh, <laughs> <laughs> but 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 there, there is an actual chemical reaction, like I said, with the metals inside, uh, and that's actually what what turns these these bad gases like carbon monoxide, uh, hydrocarbon, sulfate, particulates into a harmless state, or at least what they're calling a harmless state. I did do a little further research, Chris. There are people out there who are starting to question what happens when you break down particulate matter to a finer state. Is it now harmless now that it's just in smaller particles so now the filter needs a filter uh, there there's a lot of questions <laughs> let me just say this we are not scientists we are not going to give you a definitive answer if you're looking to argue something here we're not the guys no nope. uh, that that's not not what we're doing and if you're gonna call paul yeah, yeah absolutely at extension 2121 um <laughs> over overall one of the things to remember is that your truck needs heat so your exhaust needs heat and this i think was was a point we touched on earlier that i wanted to reiterate because I think customers, especially diesel customers, have a really hard time wrapping their head around too high of EGTs is detrimental. No. Does not equal always get the EGTs lower. No. So, like, I, I don't know how many guys feel like it always used to be like the old LB7 guys are like, oh, man, like my truck's running at like 800 degrees on the highway with a small trailer behind me. I'd really like to get that down to 650. And I'm like, why? No. Like your truck's totally safe operating at 800 degrees There's... on the exhaust gas manifold. It's not going to be any safer to run it at 650 no. on the exhaust gas manifold. But then so you what's also the benefit? you also have that flip where. You know, when you talk about operating temperatures, there's a targeted operating temperature that engines need to operate at to be most efficient. Yeah. Right. Um, and there's going to be a correlation there. Coolant temps, oil temps, exhaust gas temps. Sure. Like it all comes full circle. Um, so in these newer trucks, oh, well, the trucks run really warm. Well, it's not at the threshold of where we see it to be an issue. Right. And we do walk guys through like, hey, when you're towing and this and that, yeah. these are the EGTs that you want to stay around. So there's... 
EGTs are are more than just a number, and you have to understand what that number is in the process of how you're operating the truck, if it's going to be something that is going to shorten the life or be of a risk. Sure, absolutely. So. And like we talked about earlier, active regen needing to be at 1,100 degrees in the exhaust, that doesn't mean necessarily that they're going to run your manifold temps at 1700 right. degrees to get that right that's well, why we have a doc again just because just because the filter is running at that temperature you have to keep in mind that the truck is injecting fuel in a non-powered stroke right and depending on the application there's a ninth injector to inject the fuel after the turbocharger so these temperatures that the exhaust is seeing isn't the temperatures that the engine the head the valve and the manifold are seeing how and many there's guys, a big misperception yeah in that. and how many guys get their CTS monitor, they plug it in, yeah. and they pull up EGT, and the first thing they see is like EGT4, and right. they're like, oh, sure, this one, and they're like, oh, my God, and you're like, oh, yeah, just chill take out, it please. easy. Right. So, so as, as a rule of thumb, I don't know of any uh, Dodge, Cummins, or Duramax that ever came with exhaust gas temperature probes in the heads, or in, in the manifold. The manifold no. Just not not something that's not, ever come out. Not something that, that you've is, been able... When we talk about EGTs for stress, so how much stress is on your motor, we use EGT as a gauge of that. That EGT reference is a manifold right. temperature. So just um, to correct you here, Paul, Cummins have EGT probes off the manifold. Off the manifold. But that is not something that is, is readable through a display itself. It's It, it, it has to do with um, the, the correlation of uh, the EGR and the regening okay. of that through the truck. Copy. Um, but no, there is no factory. Someone's going to say something. Yeah, someone just going to call it. me out for sure. Um, but there is not <laughs> there is not a um, a a sensor factory in the manifold that is uh, you know utilizable. Right. So. That is for this reference. Just right? for yeah. this reference. Okay. Absolutely. Now let's switch gears. Right. We've we've talked for twenty minutes about boost leaks, <laughs> and that is the number one contender. Like I do big. truly truly Absolutely. feel that way. Um, but there's other pieces in the system that could uh, also be a direct culprit, um, and this is going to be a little bit more as of, of a severity. Right. This is a little bit more of an issue, and that's fuel system issues. Yeah. Um, you know, there's no secret. Some of the later year trucks. I don't care if it's a Power Stroke, a Duramax, or a Ram. At some point there has been a cp4 added into the equation yep. cp4s in the aftermarket or cp4s in the diesel industry are not necessarily deemed the most reliable pump trash um, straight trash don't necessarily agree with that I again know. not in uh topic of debate in, in this conversation <laughs> um but we we have seen some of those pumps have issues due to fuel contaminants and uh irregular supply uh volume of fuel and things like that yeah um but what what does that do right if you have a weak cp4 pump or a cp3 pump or oh, whatever yeah. the injector pump is yeah, yeah, yeah. and you have a I lack of pressure a lack of injection supplied pressure that is going to lower the ability of pressurizing the rail yep. and that is going to weaken the atomization of the way the fuel is sprayed into the cylinder boom therefore not being as of a higher energy so it's not going to get as good of a burn Therefore, causing a dirtier burn because it's lowering, running at a lower injection pressure. What do you think was one of the motivating factors? Like, we'll take Duramax, for example, where an 01 Duramax runs, what, 23, 24? 20, 23 and change. 23 and change. 1,000 PSI of rail pressure and an LML, L5P, well, here, no, it, L5P, it, it's 32, gotten better. It's gotten, it's gotten bigger. So, yeah. oh, uh, LOI LB7 trucks, 23 and change. Right. LBZ LMM trucks, 26 and change. Um, you see that in like the 5.9 Cummins, 6.7 Cummins. So 5.9s were right around that 23, 24,000, 6.7 Cummins um, from 07.5 all the way to 2018 was 26,000 pounds of pressure. Yeah. Then you get in, into an LML Duramax, switch gears, 29,000. Now you get into the L5P, 32,000. Yep. So the injection pressure has constantly rose. And we've seen yeah. in the aftermarket, like, We'll take my black 15 truck, for example, the Cummins. Um, that truck, we run that at 29, 30,000 pounds of pressure, right? And we get a better atomization, and it's worth some power, yeah, right? Um, and it burns clean. And it's one of the processes to helping improve on the engine's operation. This is why I think some guys have a hard time, like... Well, I just had low rail pressure. Right. It's like, well, yeah, but you didn't just have low rail. Low rail pressure in itself can also, like, just by itself could make your truck more smoky. Right. Um, and smoky, bad for DPF. I think we got that simple enough. Caveman Paul, <laughs> at it. Um, 
But but like yeah, what it comes down to is like you're talking about the actual atomization. So how how much of a mist can we turn this fuel into? Can we get this liquid into an almost gas state? And the closer we can get it to like a really well spread out, really evenly spread out gas state, the better and cleaner of a burn yeah. we're going to get. So all of the fuel is going to burn. There's going to be nothing left over. That's perfect. That that's what we're looking that's for in goal. a diesel. That's how you make it work. Uh, and like you said, that that's how we get more power and how we burn cleaner right. at the same time so a lot of people will ask well how can you tune a truck and not increase the smoke output it's like well because th- there's some science behind it to show us that that it is totally possible technology is caught up right and the we've oem's doing it too right? right it's not yeah it's not now, out of bounds now we've ran into on some trucks where you know you get the higher mileage trucks right who would have thought the day when you and i started here that we'd run into seven hundred thousand mile lml and stuff like that but that's reality the like LML we run was in, so cool when it came out we run into these trucks and um you know you'll get the guy where you know we're running into issues emission systems aren't you know cooperating and you find out that they're the original injectors in the truck well the injectors have an expiry date just like anything else on the truck um and the best aggressive way to put this is think of the the lb7 duramax when those injectors become tired right and they look like a mosquito fogger at idle (laughs) now think about that characteristic and an emissions on truck that filter is capturing all of that that's right um that's going to interfere with emissions health it's going to interfere with the dpf and the egr and the overall functionality of how that works that's right. Yeah. So absolutely. And and I just think about like simple stuff. I think I've seen this um, pretty much on all the platforms. It's like if you got a leaking injector and you're just leaking fuel into the cylinder and yeah. it's clearly just burning, like now it's just throwing extra fuel in there as a liquid form. Like we we all get why that would be terrible and detrimental to our DPF. Right. And again, as we went through all of these examples, um, they've all included a failure that was caused not by the emissions equipment but the emissions generally were the culprit of failure right? they, they were the symptom they not, were the sim- not they, the cause but they failed yeah they but all they failed. failed oh they failed so too. Yeah. when they when all you, gave up <laughs> you being the end user calling in to me and asking these questions you get the bad taste in your mouth of emissions dpf egr like it's it's the problem yeah but you remove or you alter or you do or you throw keep throwing parts at it, right? No, the emissions have a bad name. Come to find out that it was unfortunately never that in the first place. It, right. it was the mechanical components in the engine's operation um, that we could have potentially diagnosed, <laughs> right? And not through parts at the That's truck. That's right. That's right. And, and and that that is where a lot of people have this massive frustration with them. Now, there is also a reality that I thought it would just be fair for us to talk about. There are times where the emissions equipment itself is what fails or, yep. or p- components of. DPFs, it's a, it's a substrate. It's a metal filter. It's kind of hard for the DPF itself to fail unless something has failed it. I mean, let's... Um, but there's components around it. So, like, one of the things I've seen a lot of is DPF pressure sensors going bad. So, well, if the any, sensors, of, the electronics. any of the hoses yep. on the way back from the sensor get plugged, It'll just stop reading and never go into regen. That's dangerous. That's bad. That's no good. It's more common on the earlier LMLs. I would imagine some of the earlier power stroke stuff, right. although I don't know those really, really well myself. Um, but those DPF pressure sensors, that's how that's how the engine computer determines how much soot has built up in your right. DPF. It's displayed in the platforms in all sorts of different ways. But grams, we were talking earlier about grams of soot, like yeah. everybody knows what we mean. The LML measures how many quote unquote grams of soot and measures that by pressure differentials. Um, the Ford, I think Ford does a percentage if you the get it up, isn't yeah. it? And then I think the L5P is a percentage now. It is. Yeah. Um, what's the Cummins? Same. Same yeah. percentage. Okay. Uh, just like the LML to just be a They're little different. different. Yeah. yeah, for sure. But I think the LML, that was kind of a turning point. You know, when you think about emissions operations and, I mean, you know, it's just, uh, it was definitely like light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. When you think about the prior years, LOIs, LBZs, LMMs. Well, know. it's funny too, because I think, I think back about, uh, you had mentioned this morning we were in a, a meeting talking about emissions equipment and whatnot and the size of canisters. And I remember like the LMM canister held 24 grams of soot. Very small canister, it's too. Tiny. It was like tiny. Yeah. Um, and then the LML looked huge. It, right. It's double. It holds 44 grams of soot. Now, here's, it's, it's enormous. Here's and one of the unique The other things. ones get even bigger as we go forward. They, they got smaller. Smaller. They, they got smaller. So the the Ford canister, big. Right. right? Very, very big. The, the Cummins canister, like what's on mine, it's it's decent size. The newer ones are even smaller, but the piping got bigger. 
Okay. Okay. Um, what I find unique about the Duramax world is the LMM's small, and they had a lot of precious metals. A lot of precious metals yeah. in there. Then they go to the LML. The 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 filter is much bigger. Not as many precious metals in there, right? They were able to figure out like a recipe for success. Then you get to an L5P, even fewer precious metals. Filters very similar in size to an LMM. Right. So it's just it's crazy to see like, hey, we have this theory. We're going to run it for six years. <laughs> LML. And then hey, you know what? We have this new theory. We're going to try. L5P and the system works more like an LML. The the filter does not region as often as what you're going to see in an L5P, but the systems work in in their corresponding operation. Right. So it's just it's it's crazy to see. Like I would love to be part of OEM and think like, you know, do that research on what is the the reason. Right. What? Why are we doing it this way when prior we were doing it this way? Yeah. Yeah. Well. Well. What are those those areas of opportunity where like we know in our experience, especially early on, like LMMs to beat up on those or early six sevens. If your EGR failed, your DPF failed. Yeah, you were like, done. It was just it, was, it was game over. One one in, one out. You were done. It's over. Um. But, but as that gets further and further away from time. It's just like I've seen EGRs fail where we replaced the EGR and the truck's back on the road and the DPF, like, yeah, we had to do a manual regen. It was brutal. But the filter we didn't want worked. To, but, but the, the filter, filter worked and everything was good like, again. Well, yeah. okay. You know well, what we I mean? We have. Unfortunately, it's we have seen that. Each one of those components. Uh, NOx sensors. NOx sensors go out. Um, I know they're not a part of the DPF necessarily. They really they combat a different type of pollutant uh we could talk about death i think in its whole own episode because it has its whole own special place of hate in most people's heart uh but death itself one of the main causes is nox sensors go bad uh, or the uh death con contamination death contamination yep. usually that's all caused by it getting extremely cold at the end of the sprayer so the sprayer sprays it's not a great sprayer it has some leaking drops on the end of it yep. death crystallizes once it crystallizes nothing around it works uh so that's usually why yep. why you get it's usually all caused essentially by the death sprayer itself uh and then you can get codes for everything else that is one of the problems that i'd like to give um I'd like to really yell at somebody about diagnostics on pretty much every emissions equipped vehicle that I've ever seen be diagnosed uh, is why why do we get such a, a wide and random array of codes? And I, I understand the why because the tolerances are so tight on all of these. Right. And they're all so intertwined with each other that if one thing goes wrong, you're going to get several codes across the board. Um, but the troubleshooting tree could be simpler or shared with the public and that would be great. You know, tell me proof point. it. Make it easy for me and Paul. Yeah. Right? Or or your dealership tax either way <laughs> either way i'll take a swing at them um dang you know how many listeners we have that probably are call me out call me call out. paul out because that was rude out. that's right my email is c-e-h-m-k-e <laughs> at duramaxtuner.com uh chris i think that's a th i think those were the main ones that i wanted to cover today yeah. uh listeners we'd love to hear some feedback from you yeah. if you could jump on over to fans of diesel performance podcast if you're listening uh give us uh, some feedback there hey if you're watching this on youtube we really appreciate yeah, it like and subscribe that's right like that's and subscribe right. like and subscribe um and chris i was wondering would you like to give some advice uh based on our topic today there's there's three things I think that I would like to hit on. Um, aside from boost leaks, you know, doing boost leak checks, I generally try to you know kind of inform customers. Every other oil change is like what I generally do. It might okay. be a little overkill, but I'd rather be you know on top of things. Sure. Um, next would be oil uh, air filter changes, which we didn't talk Oof, about in yeah. this. Um, you know, being consistent with air filter changes and, and running a dry filter, not an oil filter. I can't stress that enough. Dry, 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 dry. Um, and fuel filter replacements, right? Just your general maintenance on top of oil changes and oil filter and stuff like that. Those go a really, really long way and guys don't really realize that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, Generally speaking, you know, try to be a little bit more proactive with, uh, you know, your your fuel filter, air filter regimens, you know, every other oil change, every couple oil changes, depending on how many miles you're putting on the truck. Um, you know, not everyone's made of money, right? But when you have a brand new truck with the way that they do cost, um, sometimes it's smart just to buy a, a, a beater commuter, <laughs> you know. Um, I like how you plug that one in there <laughs> as you did this. But, um, you know, the the reality of it is, is, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said about having, you know, just a beater car or something that's good on fuel efficiency. It's crazy to me. 
that's something that I've always practiced for years. I've always had a, a, a beater car. I've had the truck. You know, I've always had that. Sure. Um, a lot of our customers, you know, it, it's not uncommon to be in the diesel industry and not have a commuter just, car. If you if you drive in that start and stop traffic every yep. day, and that that's what your life is, and emissions on diesel cost, truck is not well. Well, let's say you also have like a big camper, and you you need the truck to pull the camper. You do right. right? Okay. I get it, but you're probably cheaper to go buy a two or three thousand dollar beater car and commute with that than you are to yeah. repair your emissions equipment if it fails no, because I mean, you're starting to stop traffic. So doing forced regens every two weeks, not good. You know, please don't do like, that. <laughs> please man, don't do that. I'm gonna I'm gonna tap into your bank account so I can buy a beater. Yeah. That's oh yeah. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Take food right off of my children's table. Um, <laughs> all right, guys. Hey, thank you so much yeah. for watching. Stick around. We're going to get a quick word from Duramax Tuner, and then we'll be back with more Diesel Performance Podcast. All right, folks, we're here with uh, our favorite super tech, Jeremy Garnett. Jeremy, how the hell are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing good, man. Doing good. Glad to have you here for our first video format on the podcast. Yeah, kind of weird, but it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Jeremy, generally we have you on and we walk through a truck that you're working on in the shop. But you and I had talked um, about, I had kind of asked, like, hey, what are three tools that you do? didn't really need when you used to be in your previous life when you were just you know a regular right. technician and then you did need a lot once you came to start working on diesels every day um yeah that's actually a very good question um one tool that you actually needed in your everyday life uh, as a gas mechanic uh you know but especially as a diesel mechanic is, um, you know, a scan tool. Um, just yeah. something that nobody to read or, but something that you can actually read data. Um, in the gas world, yeah, codes are everything. Same with the diesel. But in a diesel world, data, like, you know, how, how often do we ask for, like, data, you know, <laughs> data logs and stuff like that? It's not just the code. It's actually data logging the truck and Ex seeing what's going on. Because exactly. It, it, and I don't know if the parameters are necessarily wider or – just the symptoms are so much more all over the board, but but it does seem to come up much more often. Right. Um, and especially with uh, dealing with fuel issues and stuff like that, uh, yeah. you know, on a LBZ or an OMM, you know, you definitely want to see fuel. You, you got to see live data. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, Easy Link, you know, HP tuners, all that. You could use any of that. that that's a scan sure. tool. But you just got to have some sort of scan tool. You can buy them at Harbor Freight now. And they can buy, <laughs> heck, I think even Walmart might even sell a data. Right yeah, there. yeah. You know, something to just read codes and to just look at live data. That is, yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely crucial. That's a good one. Okay, man, what else do you got for um, us? <laughs> you. You know you need a boost tester out of diesel. We talk about it so much, right? <laughs> I know guys li listening or watching today, um, definitely we, we went into boost testing, and the stealth boost yeah. tester I know is what you use down in the shop. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, but previously the, to that we right, used others but now right, yeah. <laughs> but but it is it's one of those that i feel like every vehicle that comes in gets boost tested yeah exactly i mean sometimes most of the time before and after right so i mean we'll get it here even if it's not what we do or not what it's here for we usually try to boost test it before it comes in and then we try to boost test it after we leave especially if it's been repaired with something Ab absolutely so. okay all right so we got a good data logging tool we got a good boost tester what else are they going to need uh, a low pressure fuel gauge or a fuel gauge especially on a duramax yeah um that's a good one ex Especially because um, you have a lot of guys that run fast or air dogs or the different types of lift pumps where then you have your factory CP3 guys too. So, you know, they operate different, you it's, know? <laughs> it, it, we laugh about diesels too because it's like, well, it's either fuel or air. Right. We know that. So we just need to narrow down which one it is. Uh, but once you start talking about fuel, your data logger is helping you with all of your high side rail exactly. pressure issues. Yep. Uh, but there's this low side 
pressure issue that comes up often and it could be a lot of different things it's not to say like oh this is going to fix one problem it's like no this is going to diagnose the entire this half of the fuel (laughs) system it's it's pretty crucial exactly and then in your gas world you're only checking high pressure with the tool but, yeah but now with a diesel i want to i want to see what the low side is right i really want to see what the like if it has a fast i want to see how much this fast is supplying if it's just running the straight cp3 with a factory filter head i want to see how much that's pulling right so right am i getting my one to five inches of vacuum out of a factory cp3 exactly. yeah yep. absolutely that's good man Th- that's a nice wrap-up okay so those are the top three tools that you absolutely will need working as a diesel mechanic yes Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jeremy. No problem. Have a great day. Guys, we're going to get a quick word from Whirly Custom Fabrication, and we will be right back with you. Uh, Chris and Anthony will be talking about diesel industry news. Right, guys and now it's time to talk with our remote support expert sean lynn sean how the hell are you great how are you paul i'm doing good man thanks for asking uh sean usually i have you come on the show and talk a little bit about like a specific troubleshooting issue that you got to work through but today we decided to mix it up a little bit and you're going to talk a little bit about the three liter duramax also known as the lm2 yeah we get guys asking about it at least on a daily or weekly basis and they want to know more information on them all right. Yeah, uh, I handle some of the social media replies, and I know uh, literally every day we have a 3-liter Duramax fan out there asking us, hey, can I get tunes for my truck? What do you tell them? Not at this time. <laughs> That's the short answer, yeah. So if you were looking into this hoping that there was a bunch of research available, there's not. Um there is no current tuning solutions for the 3-liter Duramax or LM2. Why is that, Sean? We're just waiting on uh, support, basically, from the companies like HP Tuners, EFI Live, EasyLink. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So so those companies provide hardware solutions. They give us the hardware and software that then allows us to build our custom tuning calibrations, right? So uh, EasyLink is not a tuner. EFI Live is not a tuner. They are tuning platforms. So they're like the brand of tools we would use to then build a tune and install them on your vehicle. Uh, one of the big problems with this is security. Yeah, they have to go in and unlock the controller, basically, and I don't know if it's going to be anything like the L5P, but it seems like the newer GM vehicles are tougher to to break through that lock. That's right, yeah. Uh, way back in the day, we used to hear rumors, you know, about like LB7 and LOI stuff where there was kind of a, let's call it an unspoken agreement that, you know, the manufacturer would only do so much to keep the tuners out. Uh, And as time has progressed, some manufacturers, like GM specifically, has really jumped leaps and bounds to do everything they can to lock out their ECM completely. Uh, And that creates... That creates problems. Uh, This isn't necessarily new. It's been going on for a long time. I think the very first LML was tuned here at Duramax Tuner with EFI Live, and that was in 2013. So they came out in 2011. Guys were probably buying them in 2010. Uh, It was three full years of the truck being out on the road in the real world before the first tuning was ever available for it. The L5P, God, we didn't tune them in 17. Was it 18? I want to say maybe 19 we got into those. So it it, it took some time uh, is my general point. So it took some time for that platform to be out and for the aftermarket to develop the support so that tuners could like us could come in and actually build tuning for them. Yeah, the L5P was definitely a long-awaited thing, and people are loving it now. And the same thing applies to the 3-liter Duramax. People are asking, when can I tune it? What can I do? How can I get more power? Yeah. 
Yeah, the platform looks like a lot of fun. I understand the the appeal of a half ton truck with that good fuel mileage and that light of weight and that much versatility. Sounds like a great idea, and it's a diesel, so it's definitely going to going to have some overhead in it where we will have some safe room to build more power. Um, but time will tell to see kind of what that hardware solution looks like exactly. Yeah, we don't know until it just comes out. It's probably going to be like. Bam, one day we're going to have tuning support. <laughs> that's if it's it, like anything else. That's what it feels like, absolutely. All right, well, good stuff, Sean. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Paul. Wow, it is hot in here. It's never something you want to hear your transmission say. So what is that stock transmission cooler valve still doing in your truck? The problem with the stock unit is the unreliable valve that can often stick or fail completely in the closed position, allowing for hot fluid to flow back into the transmission. So we came up with a cool solution, the XDP Transmission Cooler Thermal Bypass Valve Upgrade. This upgraded TVV gives you the peace of mind that your 2013 to 2018 6.7 liter Dodge Cummins transmission is comfortable in its case. This valve doesn't allow for hot fluid to return to the transmission, reducing fluid restriction and lowering transmission temperature. The TBV is a direct replacement part. We even provide new O-rings and quick connect fittings to avoid future leaks. These additional parts also allow for use on the 6.8 RFE and ISIN AS69RC transmission applications. A cool transmission will last significantly longer than one that's consistently overheated. So save yourself the headache of getting stuck on the side of the road and that mile long repair bill. To check out the TBV upgrade and all the other ways to keep your truck cool, visit xdp.com or contact your local dealer. All right, guys, here I am with Anthony Bernini with Industry News. How are you? Good, man. How are you? Doing good. You like the camera? Dude, a little weird, but yeah, we'll I'm get not going to lie. It. We did the interview or uh, we did a we did a recording with Paul earlier. And uh, it felt weird. It felt weird. I've been yeah. behind camera, you know, a hundred times, but yeah, definitely, definitely a little odd. Sitting here in this little crowded room, we got a little mini camera in front of us. We got nice bricks behind us. Oh yeah, yeah, brick house. So you come in here and you have this sheet of paper. Yeah. And I just really want to get into the nitty gritty with this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show it for the camera. So you know, just kind of look at that. Fifty-two million dollars. Fifty-two million dollars. So what is this about? So. <clears throat> This came out. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I will kind of highlight here. Okay. Um, I talked with Joey a little bit. Joey's dad actually works for Navistar. Joey's, so, for our listeners, he's one of the other sales guys that works over at Calibrated Power. Yes. Okay. Um, so I kind of gave him a rundown. Like the first paragraph, Navistar has agreed to pay $52 million in civil, penal or civil penalties to mitigate 10,000 tons of NOx emissions in a consent decree to resolve alleged violations of the Clean Air Act. Okay. So this is uh, the EPA. Uh, going after uh, diesel manufacturer Navistar, um, and apparently for emissions violations, specifically in 2010 engines. It 2010. 10, yeah, it's okay. it was 09. It developed in 010, or they, they think they finalized some some stuff regarding it. So it looks like there's 7,749 heavy duty uh, diesel engines. Yeah, that that they're going after. Yeah, 52 million dollars. Yeah. So I want to touch on this a little bit, mm -hmm. right? Because we get guys that call in constantly. We get guys that talk about, oh, I want to delete my truck. They want to do, you know, modifications. And we walk them down this rabbit hole, right, of, well, these are the risks. These are what you're up against if you were to go that route. And we've seen over the last several years, um, XDP, they just did their settlement. Yeah. Alligator a couple of years ago did a settlement. Uh, Derive, SCT, amongst many others. Um Years back, there was the whole Volkswagen debacle, yeah. right, with the TDI the engines. The list keeps growing on this it, stuff. It does. It really does. And um, it's all in, in in efforts of pushing, you know, the Clean Air Act and, you know, uh, less pollution and things like that. But when you had this paper sitting here, I thought you were going to be joking with me huh. <laughs> for a second. <laughs> that that $52 million, I just, I, I can't, I, I cannot begin to fathom fathom that whatsoever. No, like you, you mentioned there's, I mean, there's distributors, there's shops. Like I... I, I don't know. As the day, as each day comes, I get more and more calls. No one will talk to me about the leads. Right, of course. You know, I like, you know, I'll tell guys, I'll talk to you about them. I, we don't offer it. Right. We don't get into it. Um, and the one thing that comes to mind when I read this was I had a guy about a year ago call me. He had a twin turbo LML. It had a you know, big fuel. So I'm like, truck was eight, 900 horse. Yeah, cool. And he's like, 
no one in here will work on it. I need a read to. No one will do anything. Right. And he's like, I had to put the whole thing back to stock to re-register it. Yeah. And it's, you know. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, we've had some flack on this show for, you know, uh, Justin, our producer, will uh, uh, back me on this, saying that uh, we were funded by the EPA <laughs> to do this. I've seen those comments. Um, it's been on the... We haven't got our check yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still waiting, right? Um, yeah, so I'm still waiting on that EPA. Um but you find more of this where, hey, I bought this truck secondhand. Maybe they didn't know necessarily what was done to the truck, or maybe they're just not as educated, you know, in this industry and in the market and what's going on. Um, or they built a high horsepower truck and their tuning company that they once used is no longer around because of stuff like this. Yeah. Um, to then get into a point where it's like, okay, well, I need I need new tuning support, or I have parts I need to upgrade, and you know, they're they're pretty much SOL. <clears throat> Yeah, and then it it also sucks from like we we want to help like guys calling you. I want to provide support. Right, I want to help guide you. And it's one of those where I mean I, I can't do much right. for you. And then they get and upset as a consumer. And it's an as well. industry bottleneck, right? Yeah, like it's not just you know calibrated power Duramax tuner. It's a lot of brands within the industry who you know they were potentially an outlet at one point or no longer an outlet. And I mean that goes up to the mail orders down to a lot of shops. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you have some of that going on. In light of this, you know, we have some other exciting stuff. Mm -hmm. We have another big trade show coming up. Yeah. Um, so this, what, what's the trade show that's going to be PRI. coming up here? PRI. Yep. And uh, it's in Indianapolis, Indiana. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what's what's unique with this is it, it really ties into this, you know, with, uh, with the Navistar stuff. Because we just had SEMA. You know, you brought up that, that was going on last week. Uh, PRI, you know, at the end of this month. Um, it shows a lot of, you know, the the racing scene in the industry from a performance perspective. And, um, you know, it, it kind of shows there are a lot of, I don't know how I want to, a, a, a lot of innovative things that are coming in the aftermarket to help subsidize some of this, mm -hmm. you know. Um you know, uh, emissions on stuff, you know, they're, the racing is not dead, right, with the PRI piece and SEMA. Racing is not dead, um, but there are regulations and things that need to be, you know, obtained or met in order to be that street legal versus race vehicle specific. And going to a, a show like PRI, I encourage all of our listeners, if you have the opportunity, um, it is a great trade show, just like SEMA, a little different, but again, very similar in the sense of... Uh, you know, that's that's the future of the industry, you know, from automotive. Exactly. And to touch on uh, kind of SEMA and PRI for a second, if I remember correctly, SEMA at the SEMA show it was a couple of years ago, like the EPA was there like educating guys, like saying, yep. here's here's the rules, here's where you can play, here's the guidelines. Yep. So, I mean, they, they don't want to kill racing. I know no. everyone's saying that racing's dead, you can't no, do this, can't that, do that. That's you just the got one, rules. That's the aggressive, you know, Yeah, that's a total side. other side of the spectrum. But no, they, they still want to keep the sport alive. There's rules and regulations you got to play with, just like yeah. the sports and whatnot. So um, it's they're out to educate guys as well. So of it's course. nice to see them at these events saying, "Hey, you know, here's all these cool products." Right. He, you know, by the way, yeah, yeah. by the way, you know, you just got to play, play, play by certain rules. That's all. No, that's awesome. I, I think as time progresses, we're going to see more of this type of stuff. You know, and unfortunately, it's just the nature of the beast, right? It's the industry evolving and moving forward. Appreciate you taking some time, Anthony. Yeah, not a problem. Glad to be here. Awesome, man. Thanks for joining us today, guys. Uh, this has been Paul Wilson. And Chris Emke. Make sure to like and subscribe, and we'll talk to you again soon. <laughs> Fucking just, I was just about to start talking, start laughing again. God damn it. Because the boner, it points down? I don't know. No, it just flopped. Just <laughs>